Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we have a very special guest with us, Mr. Matt Fiedler. He's the interim CEO, chairman, and co-founder of Vinyl Me Please, one of the leading names in the vinyl subscription world. And for over a decade, VMP has been the forefront of the vinyl resurgence, delivering carefully curated records to music lovers around the globe. Today, we're going to be diving into VMP's journey, discussing some of the challenges and triumphs of the past year, and exploring what the future holds for both the company and its passionate community. Welcome, Matt. Thank you for being part of the program. Thanks, Louie. Glad to be here. Glad to have you. All right, let's just kick it off, Matt. You know, VMP has been a leader in the vinyl subscription space for over a decade. What do you think has contributed the most to VMP's success and stay in power in such a competitive market? I mean, it's a really good question. Um, I Well, at first, I would say that I don't know that we got into this expecting or sort of identifying a huge business opportunity. It was more an opportunity for us to explore something that we were really interested in. And, you know, back in 2012, when we were kind of putting the first, you know, parts of, uh, of the concept together, Spotify had just entered the US, the whole model from like a consumer's perspective was changing from paying for ownership to paying for access, you know, which was great. Uh, streaming has totally disrupted the way that we think about music, share, discover, uh, and certainly, you know, the way in which music gets distributed too. Um, but for myself and my co-founder, Tyler, we're both old enough to have had experiences when we were kids with physical music. So I had a big CD collection. My dad had a big record collection, had kind of that intimate, um, you know, one-to-one -one sort of uh, experience with the tangible tactile format of music. And then we're also young enough to where, you know, the majority of our interaction with music has been through a screen or a device at some, of some kind. Um, so it was just this interesting confluence of things where, you know, the culture is shifting. Clearly, it's going more towards a commodity. Um, and at the same time, you know, we're the types of people where music defines us. And we have albums that mean a lot to us as individuals, as, as music lovers in and of itself, too. And so the thought of owning that was something that was really compelling to us. Um, and so we designed the service to to do exactly that, to bring people together in and around that shared passion for music, to really approach it from a music lover's perspective um, and to you know build a, a service that we thought was authentic to that. And so I think one of the things that has always differentiated VMP is 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 been sort of a for us by us type mentality, you know, for music lovers, by music lovers. Um, and we've gone above and beyond to really design the experience and the service uh, to cater to people that are uh, interested in that, you know, whether it be through discovery or curation or quality or um, whatever it might be. And I, I think that that's, um, you know, uniquely different. It sounds very simple, but I think a lot of competitors in this space or a lot of record of the month club models that have been tried and, and failed in the past, you know, they've been more from a, a point of view of a commercial, you know, right, or commercialized point of view where it's all about sales or monetizing existing inventory or whatever it might be. Yeah, it's a really good point. And um, and you 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 struck on something that's personal as well with actually having something that's physical. Physical media is becoming such a rarity in today's you know very streaming and on-demand world. So it's probably part of why the resurgence has kind of come back, to be honest with you. So perfect timing for yourself. When you think back on uh, the, like the last past year here, what was one of the more exciting releases or achievements of VMP, and how do you feel the community responded based on what, what how you thought they were going to respond and how they actually responded? Well, I think, I mean, every month, it's part of what I love about VMP is it changes every month, right? Like we have a new set of titles, we have a new set of stories that we're telling. Um, we're able to engage with the community and, you know, in and around a different thing. We're not, you know, a company that's trying to sell the same mattress to you month over month, right? So uh, our product changes. It's, it's a very dynamic experience in that way. Um, so I, it's certainly recency bias, but I'm, I'm just really proud of the Gus Cannon release that we put out in October, in part because, you know, the story behind that. Uh, for the curation team, store for on our team um, that was like three years in the making. Uh, he had to sort of remind the label that they actually own this uh, particular release, that they had the rights to it. Um, it was a labor of love for him in terms of like getting them to get the approvals. You know, there's a whole story around uh, scanning in the artwork and so on and so forth. But then I think it was just a really um, fun thing to kind of like define sort of a new era of VMP with. We we kind of paired that with the release of our new monthly zine in the month before. So we're trying to tell stories ahead of the actual release. And that 
we saw just a lot of people being like, oh man, I never would have considered this. But now that I'm sitting here, I'm reading the liner notes, like it's actually super interesting and I'm really excited to get it. So we just saw a lot more engagement from the community kind of ahead of that release being announced. Um, and I just think, you know, the story around it is, is fascinating. And, uh, you know, if you, if you haven't, I would encourage you to, uh, take some time, read the liner notes from the zine, um, in support of that record. It's a, it's a really cool story. No, thank you for sharing that. I got to be honest with you personally. One of the things I love about being a member is exactly what you just mentioned. Finding albums that you just weren't, it like wasn't on your radar. You probably wouldn't have gone out and bought them, but when they show up and you listen to them and you read about them, it's like, where has this been all my life? You know? So, all right, Matt, I got to dive into some of the more difficult questions. There is a, a lot of chatter on the internet around VMP. If you go to Reddit, Facebook, Discord, a lot of chatter. And some of that buzz has been around the recent release of the month consolidation and price increases. Can you kind of walk us through the reasons behind these changes and how do you see them impacting the long-term sustainability of VMP? Yeah, for sure. So for some context, so I was the CEO from inception through the end of 2020. Um, so I took the business from zero to you know whatever it was at that point. Um, I was out of the business, out of the day to day from 21 through 23. And then I stepped back in at the beginning of April in 2024. Um, I think, you know, I have the benefit of both sort of knowing what VMP was, you know, from the earliest point forward and, and being kind of uh, a key part in designing, you know, the experience and, and certainly the brand and, and the operation behind it. Um, but I also had the benefit of being able to step away from it for a period of time. And I think in that I got to experience it, you know, not unlike a member would, you know, just as a fan, as somebody who's excited about building a record collection, uh, values just what you said in terms of the experience around discovery and all that. And I think in that time, what I started to notice is as the company had tried to grow, it was really through expansion of curation. Um, and from my perspective, you know, and, and that seat being a member, it really kind of seemed to dilute the overall experience, you know, with each new additional track, there was then five records that we were considering. And if I didn't want one, then I was going into swaps. And if there wasn't something in swaps and it was kind of like, okay, what am I left to do here? And so on and so forth. And, you know, I think when we came back and, and started to engage with the community, like that experience was something that was very prevalent, right. And, and sort of created this cycle where people were swapping for credit or they're just accruing a credit balance because there was nothing that was interesting. Five records of the month and nothing uh, kind of aligning with their tastes. Um, and then moreover, I think what we started to understand too is like a key part of the value proposition within BMP is having sort of a holistic experience, right? And having a diverse and compelling set of inventory across all the different channels. So it's not just the record of the month. It's not just the store. It's also swaps. It's also kind of, you know, the archive and, and what's kind of coming um, in the future as well. And so when we think about, again, you know, putting myself in the experience of a member, it's like, yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Like I want to have something that is compelling, you know, that I'm excited to get. And it doesn't necessarily have to be something that I'm familiar with every month, but there has to be some excitement or anticipation for, for me to want to opt into it. Um, and at the same time too, as an operator, I was like, oh, this is interesting. So if we've kind of diluted the overall experience, if we've created more complexity, if people are looking at it with a little bit less of a certainty, a little less excitement, we're not actually able to invest in sort of the other parts of the experience, right? Like we'd sort of put, if we only had a hundred dollars to spend on inventory in a given month, like $95 of it was going towards paying for record of the month inventory. You know, if we were putting all of our eggs in that basket and that experience was being diluted, then we really only had $5 to expense to, to invest in the other parts of the experience. So, you know, in part the consolidation of the tracks is to say, no, we want to create a more holistic experience. Like we hear you, we understand you. Part of the benefit, part of the value of BNP comes in the record of the month for sure. But it also comes in the ability to swap for something if you don't want that, which is sort of predicated on our ability to fund the store or have new inventory in the store. Right. So it, again, we don't necessarily have a finite amount of money. So we need to be very conscious of where we're uh, putting our resources so that we can create the experience that we're ultimately trying to create. Um, and then as it relates to the pricing increase, you know, I think um, in the post COVID era, the cost of everything has just gone up tremendously, right? So again, coming back in as an operator, really being able to see the business, uh, from a new point of view, a new perspective. One thing that was very clear to me was our margin. Like we'd really lost a lot of, uh, economies of scale as we, as we had expanded into additional tracks, um, costs had gone up across the board from, you know, raw materials to shipping, to labor, to fulfillment, so on and so forth. 
more, more so than I would have expected in just sort of a, a three or four year period since I was, you know, at the helm of the business. And really the only way to, to, to right size that is to increase pricing on the, uh, on the consumer side. So yes, I totally understand that, you know, the concerns around increasing pricing, everything getting more expensive, so on and so forth. Um, and at the same time, like, you know, margin is a pretty critical part of our business, right? If we, if our margins get compressed then we just can't make a viable business moving forward and we can't deliver the experience that we really want to deliver. And margin is really important, not just for, you know, bottom line profitability. It's not like I'm trying to line my pockets at the end of the day, but it's really important in terms of being able to deliver the experience that we want to deliver. So, you know, I think another part of um, frustration has been customer service and extended reply times and uh, production delays and all that type of stuff. And those are all sort of impacts of having a very slim margin at the end of the day. So again, the, the increase in price is really an opportunity for us to continue to deliver the experience that we ultimately want to deliver, which is what people have come to expect, which is high quality stuff something that is, um, you know, above and beyond what they might expect from another uh, like service. So a, a lot of things kind of go into that. But, you know, I think that the TLDR here is, you know, I had the benefit of looking at it from a member's perspective over the last couple of years. And then certainly engaging with people really started to see and understand kind of the experience that they were having and then felt that we, we, ne we needed to make changes in order to, uh, you know, ensure the long term success of the business, but also ensure that we could continue to deliver on the experience that we ultimately wanted to deliver on. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I mean, when you think about ex uh, delivering on the experience, there's been members that have expressed concerns over recent shipping delays. What's being done to address these delays and ensure that timely deliveries are what is at the core moving forward? Yeah, totally. I, shipping delays, I think, are very clearly one of the most frustrating parts of the whole experience. In some ways, it's not always we can't mitigate it 100 percent of the time just because we're imperfect people working with an imperfect medium and it's a very imperfect process. You know, there's people like pulling levers and pushing buttons and, and things can go wrong at several different points in the process. So production delays are sort of a natural part of, of the vinyl experience, the manufacturing process. That being said, there's a lot that's within our control. Um, and I think what we, uh, when we step back in, another thing that we had really understood is that there were a lot of pre-orders that were longstanding, right? There were things that people had been waiting, you know, several months for. Um, and so in an effort to make good on those, we, we tried to put those things into manufacturing as quickly as we could. Ultimately, that created a log jam, right? We just, we had, you know, we could only squeeze so much toothpaste out of the tube at one given point, but we were trying to jam a lot more. Um, and so that had sort of a ripple effect where some projects were making it through, but other projects were getting delayed. And some projects were making it through and other projects were getting delayed. And it created this like, you know, I don't know, it was like a Lincoln log set that we were trying to build in real time. And this is something that I really learned about kind of over the uh last couple of months, it's like, we can't necessarily just throw things into production and expect it all to deliver according to the schedule that we hope that they will deliver against. Um, so we, we've gone back through our production tech schedule with a fine tooth comb. We put something out public to really bring some visibility to help people understand what is delayed, uh, what was the original ship month, what's the updated ship month. Uh, we're updating that in real time. So you'll start to see things move from, you know, delayed to shipping or uh, you'll start to see things moving from on time to shipping and so on and so forth. So we're trying to bring a lot more transparency to that process, understanding that still, you know, d some delays are going to happen along the way. Uh, so it's definitely something that we're, we're conscious of. I think internally we've kind of really sought to redesign our manufacturing process or, or kind of our supply chain to really kind of, when we put things up for sale, we do have a much clearer line of sight as to when we'll be able to deliver them. And then certainly for things that have been on pre-order, making sure that we're getting those into production, that we're scheduling them appropriately so that we're not necessarily exacerbating the issue, if you know what I mean, from a, from a, a production scheduling standpoint. So there's, it's, it's a lot of things internally that we're trying to manage and, and sort of a lot of pieces that we're moving around. Um, we have, uh, moved several projects that were delayed uh, into shipping. So I think there were probably four or five titles that were previously delayed that started shipping this month. There's another slew of titles that were previously delayed that are going to start shipping next month. So certainly over the next couple of months, I think the titles that were delayed will become fewer and then things will be more consistent on a go forward basis. That chart that you've released publicly on where things are backed up and what the expectations now are in delivery was definitely a, a great communication part, something I haven't seen before. So thank you for bringing that. I'll put a link to that chart in the description in case anybody's watching this and wondering how to find it. Uh, it also sounds like to me, Matt, you know, you, we just talked about the consolidation of ROTM. 
Uh, if you're doing five of those plus box sets, plus exclusive pressings, I can imagine that's going to back everything up when you're trying to spread yourself so thin. Yes, exactly. And it's all a resourcing thing at the end of the day. Like, you know, the company is only so big, right? So we only have so much to deploy um, in different areas of the business, right? And so when resources get constrained, this is when all this stuff ends up happening. Um, so again, it's really about trying to right size, you know, just the business with the scale of it um, and ensuring that we we, we have the resourcing needed to to run it and to operate it and to deliver against that experience. Yeah, but it, it it makes sense. You know, it, it absolutely makes sense. I, I do want to touch on something, though. In the beginning, I mentioned around VMP's influence globally, but the decision to cancel international memberships has really sparked quite a reaction amongst all of your global subscribers. Can you share with us what factors led to this decision? And is there a possibility that BNP will be reintroducing international memberships in the future? Yeah, we would, we would love to bring back international memberships. I think that was one of the hardest decisions I've had to make um, because, you know, I think in the email that we put out, I, I told the story, like in our second month, um, this guy, Max from Moscow emailed us and was like, hey, can I, I'm in Moscow, like, will you ship records to me? And, you know, we didn't really know what it would cost, but we said yes. And, you know, pretty quickly from there, we amassed uh, a, a very loyal uh, and faithful um, membership within kind of non-U.S. countries. So it's definitely a key part of what we hope to be able to do in the future and being able to reintroduce that. It really, you know, again, just kind of coming in and looking at the business fresh understanding the mechanics of it. So international shipping is wildly complex. You got that duties, taxes, shipping costs. Um, it's highly variable. So every country is different. Uh, even specific territories within specific countries is different. So there's a lot of variables to be able to manage uh, in order to deliver against that effectively. I think one thing that we really, really wanted to do or we're trying to do is, is is find a way to kind of account for all of those costs, all of those variables within the context of the subscription. But ultimately what that was going to mean is one, one of two things were going to happen. Either we were going to have like, I don't know, a hundred different permutations of the subscription because we needed to have a different thing for each, a different country for each, you know, possible add on track and so on and so forth. So there was like several different, it, it, it got exponentially more complex uh, the more we thought about that. And then two, it was probably going to be prohibitively expensive, you know, and I'm talking like a hundred dollars plus per month for international members. And some of that would have been in an attempt to like normalize costs or use the law of averages to normalize costs or to provide sort of a, a single cost as opposed to having to have different permutations of costs against different countries. Um, and that just didn't seem feasible. It didn't seem reasonable. It didn't seem like it was easily justifiable. And then still we would have, you know, a lot of complexities related to um, kind of including store in that process, accounting for additional shipping, additional VAT charges, and so on and so forth. So, and, and to be clear, international members can still buy from us. They just have to buy from the store, which is where it's much more straightforward because we can more accurately say, this is what's going to be in the box. This is the shipping cost. This is the fat associated with this order. Um, and we can charge that and we could ship it. And then, you know, we can go forward from there. Um, it just felt like it was the cleanest way to go forward. I mean, the, the, the current, um, or the previous setup was just untenable because it was a negative margin. We were losing money on most of those shipments. Uh, so again, it was kind of weighing down uh, the business in and of itself. And it ultimately meant that some members were kind of paying a tax or a premium to support other members, right? Which just didn't feel like it was equitable at the end of the day. I almost equate that to your house, like a house, like anybody watching this, their house, you have a lot of nice things in your home. You probably have a lot of things all over the place. And then you, you kind of have this moment where you just want to go in and clean everything up. Right. So you start removing things to kind of make things more presentable that, that put in a few things out on your shelf instead of having a shelf clustered. And at the end, it's a much better representation of what you actually have. It, it looks like you have more even with less. And, and I feel like it might be a bad analogy, but I feel like that's kind of what VMP is doing right now is like clean cleaning up. And so it actually has a better presentation, a better overall experience for the people that are coming in and visiting the services. Yeah, I think that's a really great analogy. And it's, it's, in some ways, it's, it's sort of a redesign or a cleanup in service of 
you know, a better experience at the end of the day. Like when you walk into your house after you've done your spring cleaning or you go into your garage after you've like reorganized things, it just feels better because it is better. You know what I mean? And again, you know, to the point of international memberships, when you have something that is a negative margin, that just puts a weight on everything else, right? And so some cases like international members were benefiting because domestic members were paying, you know, that was a positive margin. So anything that we had um, that was adding value to the business was being pulled away because we were trying to service international memberships in a way that was just unsustainable. Right. And so that then has a ripple effect to production delays and all the other stuff that have created issues, you know, kind of operationally within the business. So in an attempt, again, it all comes back to the experience that we're trying to offer. Right. And so we hate to say goodbye to international members in the current sense, but at the same time, it allows us to deliver a much better experience for everybody else while still being able to service international customers to some degree. You mentioned earlier about making tough decisions. I want to kind of talk about a little bit around pulling out of the pressing plant in Denver. What steps are being taken to ensure members continue to receive, receive a high quality records they uh, expect despite all the changes that are going on at VMP? Yeah, I think, you know, first and foremost, VMP has always built the brand around quality, right? Like that's always been something that we've uh, been very adamant about maintaining and continuing to push the bar forward. So in some respects, nothing changes about the quality of the records that we're putting out. Like we're still gonna go to the nth degree to ensure that they're, um, they're the highest quality records on the market, right? So we're still leveraging the existing partners that we have. We're still um, continuing to improve our QA processes. We're still even finding ways to um, you know, continue to improve quality within the existing infrastructure. So the good thing is nothing's changed. I mean, it, specific to margin and pricing and all that, like we could have just as easily made the decision to decrease quality uh, uh, in an effort to preserve, you know, margin or save costs or whatever it ends up being. That was a decision that we decidedly, you know, we did not want to make uh, because we knew that the second we start doing that, then really the value of VMP starts to to slip. Um, and so that's that's something that we're very bullish on. Um, as it relates to the pressing plant, you know, it's, it's a very complicated uh, story. I can't necessarily get into the details of it. I'm very excited about what they are doing. I do believe they're operational. I think they're putting out records now. So um, I think there's definitely potential that we could work with that uh, facility at some point in the future. But at the same time, you know, there was so much being hinged or being built in and around that relationship that, again, it just... It felt like it was uh, an, an unknown that was continuing to affect the overall customer experience. And again, for the benefit of our members, we felt that we needed to make changes. We needed to um, take the projects that had been put up for pre-order that were plan to be pressed at that facility, stop delaying them, stop deferring them, get them into production, still deliver a quality product, um, still be able to make good on those customer promises and continue to maintain our commitment to quality on a go forward basis. So I guess the good thing is nothing changes about the business uh, at the end of the day from a quality perspective. And, and we're still finding ways to uh, push the bar and improve quality across the board. Uh, and the other thing I would say is the impulse box set, you know, that we shipped in, uh, in August, I think the, the reviews around that from a quality standpoint are some of the best I've ever seen. People are uh, t totally in love with that package. It sounds great. It looks great. I'm super proud of, of what we were able to put together. And I think that's an indication that like, you know, we're not, nothing's changing about kind of the core uh, value proposition of the business, specifically as it relates to quality. Yeah, it's a phenomenal box set. I, I will echo that. I think every pressing in that box set has become my definitive copy. So yeah, brilliant work in the packaging is is absolutely breathtaking on that one. You guys knocked it out of the park. If, if I can consolidate all of the comments, complaints, and just keyboard rage posting that you see on social media, Members feel that changes, these changes that we're talking about have created instability at VMP. How would you address these concerns and reassure the subscribers about the company's future? Yeah, totally. I get it. I, I totally understand where people are coming from. You know, change is hard, right? And, and you know, as you said, VMP has been in business for over a decade, right? And, and in some ways, we've, we've iterated and evolved the business, but we haven't made wholesale changes like the changes we've made in the last couple of months. Um, I think some of that is because it's worked in the past. Um, some of it is because we were afraid, 
you know, and we didn't make changes when we felt we needed to, or we didn't know how to make the changes, or we didn't understand the business well enough to feel confident in the changes that we felt we needed to make. Um, so, you know, again, I think, like I said, the changes that we're making are in service of the whole, right? We're trying to continue to uh, deliver a quality product. Um, we want to continue to improve and evolve the experience for members and create more value within the experience for members. Um, and that, that focus has not changed, right? Like that's something that we continue to talk about every day. I have probably a hundred conversations about, you know, what else can we do to increase member benefit? What else can we do to, um, you know, uh, reward members for their loyalty? What else can we do? What else can we do? What else can we do? Right? So we're continuing to find ways to improve the overall experience and the members are still at the forefront of all of it, right? At the end of the day, what I will say is like we we also recognize that we are uh, we've we've taken lots of debits from the trust account, you know, over the last couple of months with some of the changes. Um, I understand that the pressing plant was sort of a, a shock and a surprise for people um, in terms of how it was previously communicated and and how um, you know people perceived it within the context of BNP. Um, understand how that then gets exacerbated by pricing changes and, uh, you know, product consolidations and so on and so forth. So, you know, I think what we understand too is that we've got to deliver, we've got to prove, we've got to rebuild, we've got to restore, we've got to earn that trust, that loyalty back. Um, in my mind, a huge part of that is delivering on these pre orders and continuing to um, make good on uh, the production schedule and continuing to mitigate delays as much as possible. And then at the same time, continuing to find new ways to reward members, continuing to find new ways to create value within the context of the membership so that people, you know, look at a price increase, not necessarily as they're paying more for the same thing, but they're actually paying more and getting more. Right. And there's a lot of things that we're doing behind the scenes and, and a lot of ways that we're trying to uh, create benefit without necessarily calling it, you know, member reward or member loyalty or whatever, just because we don't want, we don't want the perception of, of loyalty to get conflated with what we're trying to do to just increase the overall uh, benefit within the experience. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think to answer your question, long story short is continuing to deliver a quality product, continuing to find ways to improve the overall experience for members, uh, certainly making good on the pre-orders and, and, and rebuilding trust in that process. And then at the same time, you know, finding ways to create more value within within the context of the experience as well. So over the last decade, there has been numerous new subscription services that have popped up. We won't get into the names, but with so many subscription services in the vinyl space, what do you feel differentiates VMP in the eyes of the loyal customer uh, fan base that you have? And what is the plan to keep on innovating? Yeah, it's a really great question. I mean, I think some of it comes back to that uh, first question of the forest bias mentality, right? The, the authenticity with which we've built and designed the service. Um, you know, I think we have the benefit of being in business for the longest of any of these competitors. So there's some amount of built-in trust. There's built-in credibility that we have as a brand, both externally for our customers, but then also amongst artists or label partners or whatever it might be. Um, and so I think that affords us opportunity that, you know, newer, smaller uh, branches don't have, whether it be access to projects or um, kind of, uh, you know, the ability to buy just a much higher quantity, uh, which just gives us, you know, the, the ability to uh, deliver kind of a higher quality product at, at, a, at a reasonable price. Um, from an innovation standpoint, I think there's lots of interesting things going on within the vinyl market in and of itself. You see things about like uh, this plant called Good Neighbor, where they're doing uh, more around sustainable manufacturing, which I find super compelling. Um, I think there's really interesting ways in which we can uh, bring kind of the analog and the digital experiences together and, and kind of make them, uh, you know, complementary to one another, not necessarily mutually exclusive from one another. Um, storytelling is, is still a thing that we're pretty bullish on. That's not necessarily innovative per se, but I think uh, iterating and finding new ways to tell stories is, is something that we're super keen on exploring. Um, two, I think we want to create other ways in which people can engage with VMP or other opportunities um, to uh, support the, the lifestyles of our members too. I think what we started to understand is, you know, similar to your space here is that people who are VMP members also go to great lengths and, and put a lot of energy and a lot of time into their space, right? In their shrine or their listening room or whatever it ends up being, they have sort of a sacred space where their records are. So like, are there other ways that we can support that a listening experience that either directly connect to the final experience or uh, enhance it in some way, shape or form? Uh, one of the 
uh, changes that we made to the product that I think is value add is uh, we started putting rice paper sleeves in all of our records of the month, which is just a small detail that you know most people won't notice, uh, but it's something from a collector's experience I think makes a lot a pretty big difference. So uh, that's one way in which we're just kind of building that into the core experience, but then also seeing like, well, could we make those rice paper sleeves available to people? Like, would they uh, want to uh, use those for the entirety of their collection or what have you? Are there other things kind of within that experience that we can continue to support our members in? Um, can we build value and, and just kind of enroll those into kind of the core part of the experience? Or are there product sets that we can offer to people at, um, you know, meaningful price points or whatever it might be? So I think what I'm most excited about is, is obviously, yes, we're in this process of rebuilding and restoring, but at the same time, like, there's no shortage of opportunity for us. Um, and, and again, we have the benefit of being in business for a long time. We have the benefit of having a brand that people trust and can rely on that. I think it gives us the opportunity to, to create new, uh, uh, I don't want to say products necessarily or experiences or, or whatever it might be, but new ways that we can just support our members and, and create new opportunities to enhance and elevate the overall listing experience. It sounds like there's a lot being thought of on how VMP is going to move forward in the future. And I love some of the things that you're, you're mentioning. One of the things that seems really intriguing is how you're looking at potentially complementing both analog and digital. I'm excited to see what you come up with uh, on that. Uh, it, are there are there anything you could share with us from like an exciting release or initiative from the company that members can look forward to in the next few months? Yeah, I mean, I think, well, I, it's, not, it's not sexy or it's not exciting, but like part of what we're just really focused on is like to executing on the fundamentals, you know? And so shipping and restoring kind of a consistency to the experience. Um, I think we're, 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 I don't know, I'm just really excited about the conversations that we're having about different ways to round out like the swaps experience in particular. So finding ways to, you know, either create, um, I guess what I'll say is one thing that we've understood from long-term members, if you go into swaps, you know, it's, it's the catalog that you've seen, you know, a couple of different times already. And so, you know, either you've picked through things or you've already taken what you wanted or whatever. And if you've been a member for several years, it's like, it might feel stale. So just trying to find new ways to, insert new inventory in there that could be compelling or creating carve outs where, you know, this is a collection that's a, it's specific for long-term members or whatever it might be. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for us within swaps just to kind of elevate that experience and create more value within it. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. Uh, the other thing that we've uh, been testing this month is uh, for existing members. If you add a add on track, we're going to give everybody a bonus or a mystery record. Um, and so leveraging kind of this idea of like, could we create a personalized experience? Could we create sort of this um, opportunity for people to add a sort of a mystery track, you know, where it's a new record from our catalog, but we're selecting it based on what we believe to be your preferences based on your purchase history or whatever it might be, um, things that you haven't gotten before that you may not have known from our catalog or whatever. So again, that's just a really easy way for us to improve the overall experience, reward long-term members, kind of create something new that's different from uh, you know the, the way that we've always thought about the business and, and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, those are, I don't know, those are a couple of uh, looks behind the curtain, if you will. The mystery track sounds very exciting. Yeah. It I, personally, I would love that, but yeah, that sounds like a great way to keep innovation and keep people interested. Yeah, Matt, your vision over the next few years, how do you see the community growing? How do you see the company evolving, um, especially maybe after you transition out of being CEO or whatever the future plan, future holds for VMP? Yeah, well, you know, at the end of the day, our mission is to bring the world together through music, right? And I will say when we started the company, it, it, the the draw to vinyl, like I said, was just more kind of a, I don't know, it was more from curiosity than it was for like the purist point of view. Like at that mm -hmm. point, we didn't know what it meant to have a quality record. It wasn't necessarily about it sounded better. It was more about the experience that it afforded in some way. So the, the experience that we designed was more to kind of help us accomplish that mission, right? Of bringing people together, having that shared conversation or in and around music, celebrating the records that were the diamonds in the rough or what have you. I think what we've started to understand, like I said, is that, you know, our members, they're like music for them is kind of like top three priorities in their life. It's work, family, and music. 
right? And so they do a lot more than just collect records. They invest in their space. They go to shows. They buy merch. They have other collectibles. There's other ways in which they uh, experience music. So I think for us, it's it's really about thinking about what else can we do, right? Like how else can we service our members? How else can we create value within the context of, of the experience? It doesn't necessarily mean that it has to contradict the idea of vinyl, so to speak. But if you think about vinyl more as an indication or more as a, uh, a beacon of the lifestyle, right? Or sort of a, an evidence as, what, as to the extent to which people care about music. Like, you know, I think for us, it's really about finding new ways to elevate that experience, finding new ways to um, facilitate community and conversation in and around music and finding new ways to bridge the gap between artists, whether it's something that somebody has just discovered through BMP and the fans, right? And so building that connection, uh, bringing the, the community closer, uh, telling stories in a new way, just creating these experiences that, uh, again, kind of elevate and, and sort of unite people in and around that, that shared passion for music. It sounds like if we can get past the rubbish, if I could say that, of the internet grumblings, there's a big, bold future for VMP ahead. And uh, I just wanna say, Matt, thank you for sharing your insights, for giving us sort of a behind the scenes look at VMP. It's clear you and the team are deeply committed to pushing the vinyl experience forward. And, and even through your challenges, I, I know you know your viewers and I know the fans are excited to see what's next for VMP. And it sounds like you guys are thinking of all the ways to keep folks engaged. I really appreciate your time. And for those that are, are watching, be sure to check out the links below in the description for more information about VMP. Don't forget to subscribe for more interviews like this. And Matt, thanks again. It's It's been a pleasure to have you on the program and thank you for addressing these hard, heavy questions. Yeah, thanks, Louis. I appreciate you reaching out. I'm, I'm super glad to have had this conversation. Um, you know, I, I, I can't express the love and the adoration enough that I have for our community, for our member base. Um, I know we've dragged you guys through the mud. I know we're sort of stretching the limits of loyalty over the last several months. But if there's anything that's been clear to me, it's that people love this brand. People want it to succeed. People um, are very passionate about you know, not only the product, but the experience that we have to offer. And so, you know, we're, we're moving mountains to continue to deliver against that and to do it uh, in a way that honors that passion. So thank you to everybody who is a member. Thank you for people that are watching this. Thank you for people that, uh, you know, take time to, um, you know, just consider BNP, think about BNP, look at BNP, whatever it might be. Uh, you know, the, the business does not exist without our community. So uh, I'm eternally grateful for everybody that is a part of the community, um, you know, past, present and future. So thank you.